Dean's Log, Monday the 2nd of November, 1992. Chapter 1, Atomic Blowjob. I was shit scared. Shit scared of almost everything. It was the end of the 20th century. A fin de siècle horror show unraveling like the stinking entrails of a long dead dog. The Soviet Union had collapsed transmogrified into a dangerously unstable collection of hardline crypto-fascist, weirdo ethnic states. Eastern Europe had mutated into a demented bitch hydra, ripping off her ugly bread cube boiled cabbage deadheads and tossing them into the charnel houses of history. The pavanine and prismatic American dream had turned into a shit-brown nightmare. Cyber-Nazis and techno-pervs stalked the internet. And what was worse, Japan was producing good heavy metal bands. Something had to be done. It was pissing down outside. The day is seven hours and fifteen minutes old, and already it's crippled with the weight of my evasions, deceit, and downright lies. My name is Zed. I am a Zen master. And in one of my many mythical manifestations, I am part of a triumvirate of magi known throughout legend as the Three Wise Men. The other two thirds are known as Gimpo and Bill. They too are Zen masters and are both shit hot at karate. I go looking for my axe, find it, and venture out into the forest. I find a small tree, no taller than six foot. I chop it down and then cut it into three short staves. We had a plan. We were going to save the world. The whales, the dolphins, the rainforest, Bambi, the whole damn Walt Disney bunch, babe. We were gonna free Willy, we are gonna get it on with chicks, we were gonna slay dragons. We are Zen masters and know what we are talking about. Back in my cottage, I drink another cup of tea. Check one more time. Passport, air tickets, money. All I need is packed in my small black haversack. Waiting for the taxi now. This was the plan. We would take a holy and sacred picture of the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, to the very summit of the earth. Once there, we would place it with sincere reverence amongst the chimerical, shimmering palaces of ice and snow. And then, accompanied by some weird zen magic, we would light joysticks, dance about making screechy kung fu noises, get off our faces and that would be it. Planet Earth saved. Simple. I turned to Bill, who was smiling so broadly I thought his face would split in two. His eyes were damp and shining and about to overflow with tears of holy joy. I grabbed him by the shoulders like a Christian. Bill, I ejaculated. The dream! I was ecstatic. He smiled into my face and said, Yes, Zodiac, my noble friend, the dream! I span around to Gimpo. He too was beaming like an amphetamine believer. He hugged me to his manly bosom. Yes, said he laughed. The dream. Behind the mysteries of our REM slumber, we had all by some fantastic miracle experienced the same revelation. We embraced each other closely and started crying like women. God bless the fishermen, blubbered Bill. They truly love us, they love us, they love us, and we them, everyone, we love everyone. He dried his eyes on a pink silk handkerchief and handed it to me. I wiped my nose and started to tidy the room. Gimpa was arranging flowers and Bill was applying lipstick. We ate our vegetarian sausages, paid for the drinks and happily set off for the pole singing Boy George tunes. The world was beautiful and we loved everyone. I was wearing a bra. When the E wore off, we all felt truly ashamed. The interior of the car hung heavy with a macho silence like the gentle sway of a bull's bollocks in a country meadow. We drove on, 
the Clint Eastwood atmosphere broken only by the occasional raising of a single buttock to rattle the small space with a manly fart. And so to bed. In our bunks we sing Johnny Cash songs and Zed tells us the edited highlights from the life story of the Love Reaction's faithful roadie, Johnny. Now Johnny is six foot four and built like a granite wall and he's a half caste. His father went AWOL, his mother couldn't cope so Dr Bernard has took care of Johnny. Like all kids, he watched kids TV. He watched Blue Peter and Johnny got angry. If you're a British listener, you will know what Blue Peter is. If not, all you need to know is that it represents all the values that our royal family once personified. God, country, service, citizenship, thriftiness and the centrality of the family. In those days, Blue Peter had a regular gardening slot. The Blue Peter garden was in the back lot of the BBC TV centre. Young folk in our green and pleasant land were encouraged to give their dads a hand in their gardens at home. But Johnny didn't have a dad. And Johnny didn't have a garden. And Johnny got angrier. Now one night, Johnny broke into the grounds of BBC TV centre down at Shepherd's Bush. He found the Blue Peter garden and trashed it. He ripped up all the flowers and the shrubs. He smashed the greenhouse. He burnt down the shed. The tabloids made it front page news. The next edition of Blue Peter was a black day, almost as bad as the day his ship died. I don't know if Johnny was caught and brought to justice, but his actions were a pivotal point in the history of children's television in this country. From that time on, in came the mixed race and minority representative presenters, accents from far-flung outposts of our land who instructed us on what could be made from discarded washing-up liquid bottles and sticky-backed plastic. And the royal family lost it completely. Oh. Oh. 